And if the person with whom I am arguing says, yes, but I do care, I do not depart or let him go at once. I interrogate and examine and cross-examine him. And if I think that he has no virtue, but only says that he has, I reproach him with undervaluing the greater and overvaluing the less. And this I should say to everyone whom I meet, young and old, citizen and alien, but especially to the citizens, inasmuch as they are my brethren. For this is the command of God, as I would have you know, and I believe that to this day no greater good has ever happened in the state than my service to the God. For I do nothing but go about persuading you all, old and young alike, not to take thought for your persons or your properties, but first and chiefly to take care about the greatest improvement of the soul. I tell you that virtue is not given by money, but that from virtue come money and every other good of man, public as well as private. This is my teaching, and if this is the doctrine which corrupts the youth, my influence is ruinous indeed. But if anyone says that this is not my teaching, he is speaking an untruth. Wherefore, men of Athens, I say to you, do as Anetus bids, or not as Anetus bids. And either acquit me or not, but whatever you do, know that I shall never alter my ways, not even if I have to die many times. Men of Athens, do not interrupt, but hear me. There was an agreement between us that you should hear me out. And I think that what I am going to say will do you good, for I have something more to say, at which you may be inclined to cry out. But I beg that you will not do this. I would have you know that if you kill such an one as I am, you will injure yourselves more than you will injure me. Miletus and Enidus will not injure me. They cannot, for it is not in the nature of things that a bad man should injure a better than himself. I do not deny, deny that he may, perhaps, kill him, or drive him into exile, or deprive him of civil rights. And he may imagine, and others may imagine, that he is doing him a great injury. But in that I do not agree with him. For the evil of doing as Anidus is doing, of unjustly taking away another man's life, is greater far. And now, Athenians, I am not going to argue for my own sake, as you may think, but for yours, that you may not sin against the god, or lightly reject his boon by condemning me. For if you kill me, you will not easily find another like me, who, if I may use such a ludicrous figure of speech, am a sort of gadfly, given to the state by the god. And the state is like a great and noble steed who is tardy in his motions owing to his very size, and requires to be stirred into life. I am that gadfly which God has given the state, and all day long and in all places am always fastening upon you, arousing and persuading and reproaching you. And as you will not easily find another like me, I would advise you to spare me. I dare say that you may fear, feel irritated at being suddenly awakened when you are caught napping, and you may think that if you were to strike me dead, as Anetus advises, which you easily might, then you would sleep on for the remainder of your lives, unless God in his care of you gives you another gadfly. And that I am giving to you by God is proved by this, that if I had been like other men, I should not have neglected all my own concerns, or patiently seen the neglect of them during all these years, and have been doing yours, coming to you individually like a father or elder brother, exhorting you to this to regard his virtue. This, I say, would not be like human nature. And had I gained anything, or if my exhortations had been paid, there would have been some sense in that, but now, as you will perceive, not even the impudence of my accusers dares to say that I have ever exacted or sought to pay of any one. They have no witness of that, and I have a witness of the truth of what I say. My poverty is a sufficient witness. Someone may wonder why I go about in private, giving advice and busying myself with the concerns of others, but do not venture to come forward in public and advise the state. I will tell you the reason of this. You have often heard me speak of an oracle or sign which comes to me, and is the divinity which Melodus ridicules in the indictment. This sign I have had ever since I was a child. This sign is a voice which comes to me, and always forbids me to do something which I am going to do, but never commands me to do anything. And this is what stands in the way of my being a politician, and rightly as I think. For I am certain, O men of Athens, that if I had engaged in politics, I should have perished long ago, and done no good either to you or to myself. And don't be offended at my telling you the truth, for the truth is that no man who goes to war with you or any other multitude, honestly struggling against the commission of unrighteousness and wrong in the state, will save his life. He who will really fight for the right, if he would live even for a little while, must have a private station and not a public one. 
I can give you as proofs of this, not words only, but deeds, which you value more than words. Let me tell you a passage of my own life, which will prove to you that I should have never yielded to injustice from any fear of death, and that if I had not yielded, I should have died at once. I will tell you a story, tasteless perhaps and commonplace, but nevertheless true. The only office of state which I ever held, O men of Athens, was that of senator. The tribe Antiochus, which is my tribe, had the presidency of, at the tribe and the generals, who had not taken up the bodies of the slain after the battle of Arginisa. As you proposed to try them all together, which was illegal, as you all thought afterwards. But at the time, I was only one of the piratines who opposed the, the illegality, and I gave my vote against you. And when the orators threatened to impeach and arrest me, and have me taken away, and you called and shouted, I made up my mind that I would run the risk, having law and justice with me, rather than take part in your injustice, because I feared imprisonment and death. This happened in the days of the democracy. But when the oligarchy of the Thirty was in power, they sent for me and four others into the rotunda, and bade us bring Leon the Salmanian from Salamis, as they wanted to execute him. This was a specimen of the sort of commands which they were always giving, with the view of implicating as many as possible in their crimes. And then I showed, not in word, only but in deed, that if I had be allowed to use such an expression, I cared not a straw for death, and that my only fear was the fear of doing an unrighteous or unholy thing. For the strong arm that the oppressive power did not frighten me into doing wrong, and when we came out of the rotunda, the other four went to Salamis and fetched Leon, but I went quietly home, for which I might have lost my life had not the power of the thirty shortly afterwards come to an end. And to this many will witness. Now do you really imagine that I could have survived all of these years if I had led a public life, supposing that, like a good man, I had always supported the right and had made justice as I ought the first thing? No, indeed, men of Athens, neither I nor any other, but I have always been the same in all my actions, public as well as private, and never have I yielded any base compliance to those who are slanderously termed my disciples, or to any other. For the truth is that I have no regular disciples, but if any one likes to come and hear me, whether I am pursuing my mission, whether he be young or old, he may freely come, nor do I converse with those who pay only, and with those who do not pay. But any one, whether he be rich or poor, may ask and answer me, and listen to my words. And whether he turns out to be a bad man or a good one, that cannot be justly laid to my charge, as I never taught him anything. And if any one says that he has learned or heard anything from me in private, which all the world has not heard, I should like you to know that he is speaking an untruth. But I shall be asked why the people delight in continually conversing with you. I have told you already, Athenians, the whole truth about this. They like to hear the cross-examination of the pretenders to wisdom. There is amusement in this, and this is a duty which the God has imposed upon me, as I am assured by oracles, visions, and in every sort of way in which the will of divine powers ever signify to anyone. This is true, O Athenians, or, if not true, would be soon refuted. For if I am really corrupting the youth, and have corrupted some of them already, those of them who have grown up and have become sensible that I gave them bad advice in the days of their youth should come forward as accusers and take their revenge. And if they do not like to come themselves, some of their relatives, fathers, brothers, or other kinsmen should say what evil their families suffered at my hands. Now it is their time. Many of them I see in the court. There is Crito, who is of the same age and of the same deem with myself. And there is Critobulus, his son, whom I also see. Then again, there is Lysanias of Svetus, who is the father of Iskines. He is present. And also there is Antiphon of Cephasus, who is the father of Epigenes. And there are the brothers of several who have associated with me. There is Nicostratus, the son of Theotides, and the brother of Theodotus. Now Theodotus himself is dead, and therefore he, at any rate, will not seek to stop him. And there is per Perilus, the son of Demodocus, who had a brother, Theages, and Adamantus, the son of Ariston, whose brother Plato is present, and Antidorus, who is the brother of Apollodorus, whom I also see. I might mention a great many others any of whom Miletus should have produced as witnesses in the course of his speech, and let him still produce them, if he has forgotten. I will make way for him. 
and let him say, if he has any testimony of the sort which he can produce, Nay, Athenians, the very opposite is the truth, for all these are ready to witness, on behalf of the corrupter, of the destroyer of their kindred, as Miletus and Anitus call me, not the corrupted youth only, there might have been a motive for that, but their uncorrupted elder relatives, why should they too support me with their testimony? Why, indeed, except for the sake of the truth and justice, and because they know that I'm speaking the truth, and that Miletus is lying?